Now, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Bill Crossley. I'm the J. William Urig and Anastasia Vornas Head of Aeronautics and Astronautics here. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2022 William E. Boeing Distinguished Lecture. Really pleased to be bringing this lecture back. We put it on hiatus because of the pandemic, and so really pleased to have everyone here and get this back started again. Um, it is the William E. Boeing Distinguished Lecture. So before we begin, I'd like to recognize a couple of colleagues from Boeing who have come today to help us with this. Um, if you'd like to stand real quick, I'd like to introduce Wayne Tigert. He's Vice President and General Manager for Boeing Test and Evaluation. David Loffing. <laughs> David Loffing, the Vice President and Chief Program Engineer on the 777X. And Lee Faber, the Chief Engineer of Weights, Loads, and Dynamics for Boeing Commercial Aircraft. So again, thank you for, for supporting us and being part of the job today to, to welcome our guest. I have one more special Boeing representative here with us today. He's a Purdue electrical engineering grad, and he is the Boeing chief technology officer. His name is Todd Citron. Todd's also the vice president and general manager of Boeing Research and Technology. He has oversight over Aurora Flight Sciences and the Boeing Research Centers. So today, Todd's going to give you a little bit of the history about this lecture, about the history between Boeing and Purdue, and then he's going to introduce our guest speaker, Grazia Vittadini. So Todd, please come on up to the stage. Well, thanks, Bill. It's uh, really great to be back on campus to resume this William E. Boeing lecture series. It's just one example of the great collaboration between Purdue and Boeing over many decades. And it's terrific to, to honor our founder and all the innovation he brought. And you know, I think it's, as I said, just one example. With Purdue, Boeing is working both on collaborative research, had the opportunity this morning to see many examples of that, as well as interest in jointly developing students. And so a few recent examples are the Boeing Mach 6 wind tunnel and the Boeing Intel Build Test Center. And these are just a, a few examples of the great collaboration with Purdue. And if I reflect on this lecture, if you've gone to the website, you can see that over the 20 years since it was started in 2019, 20, uh, excuse me, 1999, there's quite an illustrious list of speakers, uh, luminaries really of the aerospace industry. And so it's really my pleasure to be here today to introduce Grazia Vattadini, the CTO and Chief Strategy Officer for Rolls-Royce. And Grazia has uh, done a, a great job since coming into that position in November of last year. Prior to that, Grazia had 20 years with Airbus and has the distinction of being the first woman that was elected to the Airbus Executive Committee and also served as the Chief Technology Officer there at, at Airbus. And Grazia has, has demonstrated the ability to direct transnational teams and is an innovative forward looking thinker with drives in artificial intelligence and quantum computing is just a few of the examples. Grazia has also served on a number of boards and advisory committees, just to name a few. She's on the Siemens Supervisory Committee. She's also an advisor to the German Mobility Committee as well. She also has gained a number of honors, and I'll mention again just one. She recently was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science from the Cranberry University in the United Kingdom. And just on a personal level, since I've gotten to know Grazia, she is a person of, of great intellect and tremendous energy and, and a warmth that I think you will see. So it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce Grazia Vattadini for the Bo William E. Boeing lecture today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. And well, I'm really moved and touched by your kind introduction, Todd. Thanks for that. Dear Bill, dear Purdue students and faculty, friends and guests, it's uh, such a privilege uh, and pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today to deliver the William E. Boeing Distinguished Lecture. Named in honor of one of the greatest pioneers um, in aerospace, founder of the Boeing Company. Uh, this lecture series has featured some of the leading figures uh, of the aerospace industry, and so no pressure at all. Um, <laughs> I really feel humbled. Uh, I really feel humbled and excited to try and follow in their steps 
and uh, as, as this year's as this year's guest guest speaker. And I am also particularly honored uh, to be talking today at an institution with such a rich and long-standing history in our space, pioneering innovation and creativity. The School of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue University is one of the leading aerospace research institutions worldwide. With a very long track of graduate um, alumni who've achieved extraordinary accomplishments in the course of their lives. And what's more, established in 1969, the Purdue Women in Engineering program was the first program of its kind in aviation, uh, in the nation and in aviation as well, uh, serving as a model for, as a blueprint really, for, for similar programs at other, at other universities. And since then, the enrollment of uh, women in the College of Engineering has gone from less than 1% to the current 26%. So hat tip Purdue, that's, that's real achievement. However, women continue being um, underrepresented in engineering and, and technology jobs. And we need to continue doing more as a society, as an industry, to encourage girls and young women to really embrace engineering degrees and careers. And in this sense, a true source of inspiration, and not only for, for women uh, in, in aerospace, and definitely one of the greatest pioneers to pass by Purdue University, is undeniably Amelia Earhart. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her story, for those who are not, well, Earhart was a pioneering aviatrix and the first woman to fly solo and nonstop across the Atlantic. And that was pretty much 90 years ago. And from 1935 to 1937, she served as advisor uh, for aeronautical engineering and as counselor career counselor for women here at Purdue. Well, she made history by crushing aviation records and championed the advancement of women in aviation. During her life and still today, she continued to inspire people of all ages, including myself, to follow their dreams and take to the skies. Now, she wrote um, quite a few books my very favorite is, is titled The Fun of It. And The Fun of It, besides paying a tribute to other women in aviation, including the often forgotten Wright sister, Catherine Wright, she also encourages women to go and take that first flight lesson, which will take you to your license and to enjoying flight. Um, and to address the fear of getting lost, up there, you know, no GPS, no navigational aids. Um, she makes it very simple. She says, you know, eventually you'll cross a rail track, right? So just follow these tracks and at some point you'll see a station. And it's just a matter of flying low enough to go and read on the, on the <laughs> at the station where you are. And in case you don't, manage doing that, well, don't be shy. Just land and ask someone, where am I, right? So these were the days, these were the days. Fact is, Amelia is really an icon, an icon of, of courage, of determination, and perseverance. And I find she embodies that pioneering spirit, that can-do attitude that we require today in the aerospace sector more than ever. Why? Because today's challenges will require us to do something different, and to continue relentlessly pushing on the boundaries of aerospace technology and seeking for new solutions. Now, as I mentioned, William E. Boeing was also a true visionary whose passion for aviation 
led him to establish what would become the world's largest aerospace company. Now, crossing the Atlantic, my trip started in, in Germany where I live and coming over to the US, I sort of traced back his steps, right? So his father, Wilhelm Boeing, came from Germany. His, uh, his mother was, was Austrian. And you know, me and myself, I have a dual citizenship. I'm Italian and German. Uh, I grew up partly in the States. I work for a British company, and here I am addressing an international audience. Why, why am I telling you all this? Because I think it reflects directly the strength and the purpose of our industry, of aviation, and that is connecting the world, making the world smaller as a means of transport, as an international industry bringing together friends, families, business partners, or as a community of academics and aviation enthusiasts all over the world, working together towards new um, innovative technologies. Aviation is, is indispensable in our time. And accordingly, we see after the pandemic, air traffic soaring again. For North American carriers have seen the IATA figures recently published. For North American carriers, the traffic was, was up over 110% in August uh, compared to the previous year. Uh, European carriers experienced a bit less. We're, I think we're still um, at 80% at more or less for the same period. And I think as passengers, Overall, we got a firsthand experience of this impressive increase in the equally impressive queues um, at many airports around the world. However, despite this crucial and, and absolutely indispensable role, aviation is also part of one of our biggest challenges currently, and that's, that's climate change. If we want to continue making the world smaller, if we want to continue connecting it through aviation, if we want to preserve the planet we love to discover, we're going to have to somehow master the challenge of making aviation sustainable. And let's be clear, this is no easy feat. It's a daunting, daunting challenge. Let me give you an idea of what this means in, in, in figures, in facts and figures. Now, in 2020, uh, when the COVID crisis was in, in full swing, we basically stopped flying, apart from the freighters, which were carrying around the vaccine so dearly and badly needed all over the world, medical equipment. But commercial flights pretty much stopped. Our economies came to a halt and global CO2 emissions declined by 8% globally. Now, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, that very same agreement rejoined by the US back in February 21 um, with President Biden, so limiting global warming, global CO2 emissions need to continue declining by 8% every single year for the next 30 years in a row. That's the size of the challenge. And however, well, for aviation, the bar is constantly, is constantly rising. Why? Because the demand for air travel is not constant, keeps on increasing year by year. And that's not just a temporary rebound effect um, after the crisis. More and more people want and can afford to travel by plane every year. We have um, a, a global middle class growing continuously. And as a result, there are some theoretical um, calculations projecting that demand for air travel could double. It doubles pretty much every 20 years or so, um, and therefore, in the next 
uh, 10 years, so 10 years from now, if we follow that progression, uh, we will be flying about 6 billion passengers per year. Now, it gives, it gives a feeling of, of the trend. And I think what these figures tell us is that if we are not ready to do something different and to change the way we operate, uh, well, there's the risk that we could fall victim of our own success as industry. Uh, we're going to have to cut our emissions even more, even faster, uh, to account for the increase uh, in, in air um, travel. Else, we would um, contribute, um, we would increase uh, uh, our contribution to global warming well beyond today's round about 3.5%. That's the effect aviation has on, on global warming in terms of emissions contribution. Now, you'll tell me, um, you know, fine, Grazia, that's all very true, but hey, you're a corporate spokesperson. You're no Greta Thunberg. Um, you're not a climate activist, right? So your first interest is making money, uh, business. Um, not really to save the planet. Um, so what's in it for you, really? Um, well, if you think about it, making aviation more sustainable is a business imperative, beyond being, of course, an important responsibility. Our future competitiveness depends very much on our ability to deliver on sustainability environmental targets. If we do not, if we do not, we risk losing important customers and important markets which have set themselves very, very ambitious goals to limit global warming. About one third of our revenues at Rolls-Royce are generated in Europe. The UK, and the European Union uh, signed up to be climate neutral, committed to be climate neutral by 2050. And um, to this end, all transport related greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced by 90% compared to the 1990 levels. Another third of our Rolls Royce revenue um, comes from business over here in the United States. And President Biden has, has committed to reducing the, the US overall greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. Uh, and just last month, he announced the quote, most aggressive action ever against the climate crisis. Now, worldwide, almost 95% of all states ratified the Paris agreement, agreement, promising to keep that global warming below 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And not even two weeks ago, the 184 ICAO member states collectively committed to the long-term aspirational goals of reaching net zero carbon emissions in aviation globally by 2050. So it's real. Not only for our environment, but also for our economy, sustainability is becoming a matter of survival. In more corporate pitch words, we cannot afford to be part of the problem as an industry. And being part of the solution, make no mistake, it will pay off. And even more, I am convinced that the societal and environmental imperative of getting to more sustainable solutions is also one of the greatest business opportunities of our times. Like Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. Now, before we can all pat ourselves on the backs for being so ambitious. Um, there's a little question still open. Um, 
How are you going to do that? How? How do we seize this great opportunity and manage making aviation sustainable? Well, there is no answer. Not yet. No simple answer. And what's for sure, there is no single solution. Well, one size fits all miracle to make it all sustainable. There's different factors coming into play and we need to keep our minds open and continue exploring every factor. Now, airplanes emit CO2 and consume resources throughout their life cycle, during production and operation, even once decommissioned, which means the aviation industry's levers to act on sustainability range across this very broad span. Innovative materials, recyclable materials, lighter and lighter structures, optimized flight routes that could, uh, a, a decent air traffic management optimizing for, for emissions could bring to something very close to 10% abatement of CO2 emissions. So that's not negligible. Recycling our, project, our products, and this is just to name a few of these levers. Now, um, as, as Chief Technology Officer of Rolls-Royce, of course, my focus is on propulsion. And it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, more than 97% of Rolls-Royce-related emissions occur when our engines fly, when our products are in use. And this is where we can make our contribution for, for a sustainable future count. And this is the area I'll try and focus in a little bit more with my examples. We can power aviation more sustainably by progressing essentially in three fields. Continuing to improve and increase the efficiency of our products. Then second, leveraging sustainable aviation fuels. And third, continuing to research and explore the so-called third generation technologies. So let's dive right in. First of all, efficiency. Now, increasing the efficiency, continuously improving the existing products may, um, you know, not sound terribly exciting. But let me reassure you, there's some incredible engineering going on here at Rolls-Royce. And these are incremental solutions we can put into practice immediately. And time is of the essence. So the sooner, the better. And we haven't yet seized our full potential in this field. And every single drop of fuel we can save makes a difference and counts. And you know, if you look briefly back at the history of aviation, you, you can see how much we've already achieved here. Since the very first commercial jet aircraft in the 1950s, CO2 emissions per passenger a mile have gone down already by 80%, okay? So it's not that we've been just flying uh, without, without um, taking care of, of efficiency until now. This is the power of continuous improvement and gradual progress. So if we're serious about our net zero targets, this is definitely something, a potential we're gonna have to continue tapping into. And this is why we continue pushing the boundaries uh, and the limits of our existing technologies. Um, and we achieve some very tangible and significant results by doing so. Let me cite our gas turbines as, as one example. Innovative turbine technologies that we develop in our ultrafan demonstrator, which you can see here on the slide next to me, well, these, these technologies offer 25% more fuel efficiency than the first generation of Trent family. That's the name. By the way, this, the Ultrafan, will be coupled with a power gearbox producing 
64 megawatts. That's more than enough power to, to, to supply two cities of the size of West Lafayette. Now, one of the requirements to make engine, an engine more efficient is basically to increase the uh, turbine entry temperature. And this is where amazing design principles, advanced materials, we're talking about super alloys, manufacturing technologies, which are really at the edge of what is feasible, enable reaching temperatures inside our engines, which are basically hotter than molten lava. We operate beyond the melting temperature of the turbine blades. Basically, it's like putting an ice cube into an oven and trying to keep it from melting by managing the airflow. It's mind blowing. And there's potential that comes along with this increase of operating temperatures to improve the efficiency by 5% in addition to, to what I already stated. And doesn't it look beautiful in addition? So uh, efficiency, it proves that efficiency is actually magazine cover material as well as contributing to more sustainable aviation. So impact is real, it's sizable, it's indispensable. And beyond that, more efficient turbine technology uh, will not only reduce the need for conventional kerosene, will also pave the way for the introduction of new and as now very, very expensive alternative fuels, right? By improving their economics. And this brings me to the second field of action, leveraging sustainable aviation fuels or SAFs. This um, lever is mighty. Just consider if we flew exclusively using sustainable aviation fuels from tomorrow, this would instantly reduce our CO2 emissions by around 80% with some conditions, which I will now go into. But moreover, by implementing SAF, we, we can continue using its so-called drop-in fuel. We can continue using the existing engine technology and the existing infrastructure for fuel distribution, right? Great, this sounds awesome. Problem solved. Um, hmm. There's a catch, more than one actually. The first issue, um, in an industry like ours where we put safety first, um, is certification. Most of our aircraft today are certified uh, with, to fly with a maximum of 50% sustainable aviation fuel. So it's not an impossible feat. It's not a hard limit. We are, there's plenty of projects underway to demonstrate that we can get safely to 100%. On this very sl uh, slide um, near me, you see Her Majesty the Queen of the Skies, our 747 um, flying test bed aircraft with its Trent 1000 engine. And with this very aircraft, we uh, conducted a test flight together, together with Boeing using indeed 100% SAF. And also the UltraFund demonstrator you saw on the previous slide is gonna, is gonna run on 100% SAF. But um, okay, let's assume every single aircraft worldwide has now the necessary certification and we can fly with 100% SAF, great. Second challenge, um, how can we provide enough affordable SAF to replace conventional kerosene? Because as of today, there's simply not enough of it to, to power the worldwide fleet. Today, SAF accounts for a miserable 0.1% of global um, jet fuel use and it's incredibly expensive, up to a factor five to eight versus kerosene. So production needs to be scaled up significantly to meet demand and to meet affordability requirements. And this is an undertaking into which fuel producers and policymakers must take the lead uh, with 
financing for what could be a multi-trillion dollar transition as a crucial enabler. Um, nonetheless, even if we're not fuel producers, um, we at Rolls-Royce together with the aviation industry as, as a whole, uh, work relentlessly towards the uptake of, of SAF. And we, um, our goal is to um, demonstrate that all our products are compatible with 100% SAF by 2030. Uh, and um, yes, so if we get all our plan, our, our, our planes, our engines certified, and if the production scales, we would achieve, what did I say, 80% reduction emission? Um, there's a condition to that. Because, and this is another challenge, SAF can only be truly sustainable. So either it's biofuel, right? And then it's really the yield is pretty limited. You need to take care that you're not using agricultural land to produce it or fresh water. So we're talking about synthetic fuel here. And the challenge is that it can only be truly sustainable if it is produced sustainably. So to synthesize kerosene, you need CO2, you need hydrogen, and a whole lot of energy. So where do you take that CO2 from? If you really want to initiate this virtuous cycle, well, you need to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and green hydrogen um, per hydrolysis, for instance, out of water, which means, which all requires uh, a huge amount of low carbon, scalable, affordable, and reliable energy, and a major capacity building effort to synthesize then these, these products. And this is, again, something we can contribute to, even though neither we as a company at Rolls-Royce nor the aviation industry can make it all on its own. What we're doing, for example, um, at Rolls-Royce is building a demonstrator, a demonstrator direct air capture system to absorb CO2 in a very novel way, which is extremely sustainable because it doesn't consume a lot of water like many other systems out there. And it's also um, not so energy hungry. And in addition to that, we are engaging into building small nuclear power stations, modular power stations that could power both the CO2 capture and hydrogen um, production and um, the manufacturing process of SAF. But uh, mastering all these challenges will, will take some time. And that's why it's important to focus the use of sustainable aviation uh, fuels, especially there where they really make a difference, and that's on long haul flights. Even if long haul flights account for only one quarter of global air traffic, these flights make up three quarters of, of global aviation emissions. So that's where I believe we should, we should start. Now, what else can we do to continue investigating, researching solutions to achieve net zero? I briefly touched upon third generation technologies as technologies which really hold the promise to, to slice down emissions, um, CO2 emission, almost um, to zero. Um, we're working on different fronts at Rolls-Royce in this sense, looking at hydrogen combustion technologies and looking at hybrid electric or uh, fully electric propulsion. So let's see what are the chances, the opportunities, and the challenges associated with these two streams. Uh, in terms of hydrogen, well, theoretically, there's two ways to fly on hydrogen. Um, either with fuel cells, 
powering an electrical motor, or um, indeed um, through hydrogen combustion engines. Um, now, again, the general uptake of, of hydrogen, of green hydrogen, in global aviation is conditional on a massive increase in the production of green hydrogen and energy. So the challenges are not dissimilar than the ones I just spoke about uh, on, on, on SAF. And we, Rolls-Royce, are not a fuel provider, but we do have a business unit um, called Power Systems for Stationary Energy and Power Generation. And they're working on the development of a solution to produce hydrogen affordably and on a large scale uh, using um, green electricity, so through, um, through the use of electrolyzers. Um, and this is perhaps a way to lay an additional foundation for the successful uh, expansion of green hydrogen production, which we will need anyhow to synthesize SAF and which many other industries will need too, like the steel industry, shipping, trucking industries. They also have an interest to see green hydrogen production scaling up quickly. Now, um, there's a couple of challenges um, connected to flying with hydrogen. And one, well, is definitely um, associated with storage storage of hydrogen, right? So we're talking about, um, compared to, to kerosene, um, well, hydrogen, and if you look at the energy density, hydrogen is four times the volume of, of kerosene, right? So you're gonna need huge tanks. And if you're going into liquid hydrogen, well, these tanks are gonna have to be cryogenic. Uh, so that's normally rocket science, right? Rockets, you burn your hydrogen or whatever it is you're, you're, you're using in, in a matter of seconds, right? Now, flying with um, cryogenic tanks on an aircraft, which needs um, fuel for a bit more than a couple of seconds, will be, will be a challenge. It will impact aircraft uh, design. It will impact... Um, of course, the entire aerodynamic, um, and it will make, um, it will trigger a chain reaction of, of change, uh, which, which is really, at the essence, uh, demonstrate the complexity of doing um, things radically in a radically different way in, in aviation. This doesn't apply only to the aircraft, but also to the, to the infrastructure, right? So that, that's where that chain reaction continues. You're gonna need a new infrastructure to store and distribute um, liquid hydrogen, and that still needs to be, to be created, right? So um, our race to net zero uh, can only be successful if we take it step by step, and if we collaborate, if we collaborate across industries, across companies, and across national borders. Now, this is the path we're, we're following at Rolls-Royce. We announced um, back in July uh, at Farnborough a partnership with the airline EasyJet with the common goal to go and, and understand what would it take to have a um, gas turbine burning hydrogen, combusting hydrogen, right? Um, and this is the very first step of assessment where we're performing so that whenever airframers will be ready to store and distribute hydrogen on board, Rolls-Royce will have a propulsive solution ready. So um, to this end, we're gonna be performing a series of engine tests on the ground. And um, the very first one is with our Rolls-Royce AE2100 engine, which you see here on the slide. The, the test, the very first test, is currently in the final stages of a preparation. Engine is ready. The hydrogen has been delivered, and it's been quite a challenge um, finding hydrogen, even only for our testing purposes. And now we're just looking forward to pushing that button and sharing the results of that test uh, in the very near future. 
So again, um, sustainable aviation powered by hydrogen is a very particular uh, challenge which requires um, absolutely a cross-sectoral uh, team effort to produce enough of it, and it must be green, to adapt um, the, the airframe and to build the infrastructure on ground, plus, of course, a couple of challenges we still have to master in gas turbine design. But okay, in, in the end, hydrogen has the potential, perhaps one day, to play a key role in decarbonizing, contributing to decarbonizing, um, to decarbonizing aviation. Now, specifically on, um, on shorter distances, there may be other, other options. You know, when you need to connect remote areas or little, not so densely populated islands to urban centers, this is where all electric propulsion or hybrid electric propulsion could come into play. Because um, these solutions not only reduce in-flight CO2 emissions to basically zero, if you go all electric, um, but also have the potential to reduce other types of emissions, most notably um, nitrogen oxide, NOx, and noise. Uh, and this is why um, hybrid electric, electric propulsion could bring aviation closer to, to our cities, creating an entirely new business segment, which is called advanced air mobility for regional and potentially even urban routes. Now, there's quite some skepticism when talking about air taxis. Is this a fun toy or do we really need it and why? Now, um, theoretically, from the analytical perspective, if you look at the, at, at the figures, right, global demand for regional and even urban air mobility is predicted to soar. By 2050, it's projected that more than 70% of, um, of the world population will live in cities. So um, traffic jams won't get any better. Um, traffic in between cities will probably continue to increase and, and bring literally ground-based transport infrastructure to, to a hard physical limit. And, and so this is why certain companies um, estimate one day that, you know, AAM could even outpace uh, today's um, helicopter and aviation business. Well, so this just to say, let's, let's factor in talking about sustainable future for aviation. Let's factor in um, regional and, and urban air mobility. I think startups are predicting by 2035 something like 15,000 eVTOLs um, flying around uh, worldwide. Now, um, yes, um, let's not forget it's not just a matter of, of technologies, of electrical propulsion. Um, it's also a matter of air traffic management and having um, an airspace structure to possibly accommodate even a small portion of, of these 15,000 eVTOLs, right? Um, three helicopters over a city normally mean a traffic jam, right? So we're gonna have to do something also under the um, air, um, air space structure, definitely. Um, there's anyhow challenges even in electrical uh, flying um, electric aircraft are only as sustainable as the electricity that they're running on and they're going to need a different infrastructure on the ground and of course there's a bunch of technology challenges around electrical propulsion unit around energy storage systems augmenting generators and uh, electrical power distribution systems just as an example. And for all these challenges, we need 
partners going um, in and beyond our, our own industry. And this is why we've joined forces with Airframer Technum and Scandinavia's largest regional um, airline, Vidura, uh, to deliver an all-electric commuter aircraft. And on the slide here, you can, you can see a rendering of what it might look like. Now, um, it's a quite ambitious um, plan because it's targeted to be ready for service in less than five years. That's 2026, I believe, enter into service. Um, in addition to that, this summer at, at Farnborough, we signed a partnership agreement with Hyundai uh, Motor Group with a joint intent to deliver battery electric and fuel cell electric solutions to the advanced air mobility and regional air mobility markets. And uh, we plan the development of a joint fuel cell electrical aircraft demonstrator by 2025. So again, partnering, partnering, and partnering, we can achieve some tangible results into driving sustainability and maturing technologies also for the advanced air mobility market. And this is all in all um, how we will get closer to making net zero aviation a reality. So as you can see, we face an enormous, enormous um, challenge as a company and also as an industry as a whole. Aviation plays an ever important role connecting economies, connecting cultures, people all around the world. And if we want to continue enjoying this and protecting our planet at the same time, we need to strive for more sustainable solutions. So today I spoke mainly about the technical challenges we face in increasing the efficiency, in leveraging SAFs, in exploring third generation technologies. These are the main fields of action where we must become more active to power aviation sustainably. However, the levers for change cannot be adjusted and operated just by one company or just one player alone. So this is going to require the collaboration and joint efforts of the entire aerospace sector and all partners involved from academia and industry uh, financiers, politicians, regulatory authorities. And this, dear students, is where you come into play. As graduates of Purdue University, you are the pioneers of, of tomorrow who will be called upon to continue uh, trailblazing innovation and lead this transition. And as such, you will follow in the footsteps of William Boeing and Amelia Earhart, who broke boundaries and chartered new paths. The challenge is real, the ambition is very high, and in the words of Amelia Earhart, there's more to life than just being a passenger. So let's hear her call, let's take that seat front left and pilot change together. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much. Let's thank Grazia one more time. We have a chance to answer a few questions. We have a couple of microphones positioned in place. So if you want to come down and ask Grazia a question or two, please come forward and, and do that at this time. We'll try to call on a few of you if you have some questions for her. Come right up. So Hi. you really focused on the aircraft and their engines, the emissions coming from them while uh, they're in operation. Are there some ways that we could make the production and manufacturing of these parts uh, more sustainable? And what happens when uh, they're decommissioned? Uh, this is a very, a very good question. And indeed, um, what you're, you're going into, the concept of life cycle assessment, which is something uh, becoming absolutely 
of vital importance to our industry because indeed it's not just the emission, it's not just what do you do with the products once they're, you know, they, they, they've, they've done what they were supposed to be doing, but it's the whole, absolutely the full cycle. And there's material um, like composite material, for instance, which is particularly uh, challenging to recycle, right? So, and this is also where we must look into um, technologies to help us do exactly that. I um, have seen pilot projects, for instance, using pyrolysis to um, recuperate the carbon out of, of CFRP material whilst generating uh, heat, which then can be used uh, with electrolyzers to, to generate electricity. So uh, indeed, it doesn't stop at technology applied to our products, but it's also technology applied to manufacturing and, uh, and to methods to recycle um, the, the material our products are made of. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. It, you know, your talk means a lot to me as a student. I'm a senior here at Purdue University, so, and, you know, deep down inside, I really do appreciate your talk. Um, I was wondering, um, I know that climate policies, they really focus on CO2 emissions nowadays, um, but do, do the technologies that you have mentioned today, do they affect other types of emissions? Well, yeah, absolutely. So we, the focus currently and specifically the regulatory focus, scope one, scope two, scope three, what we need to disclose uh, in our financial and non-financial reporting as companies is all centered on CO2. Uh, but indeed, we know that there's other types of emission like, uh, like NOx, um, like, like contrails, that's also particulate. So um, every single um, solution I've, uh, I've, I've highlighted to reduce as one or the other, but we need to continue holistically considering all of them. And at some extent, there still is also a lot of research, academic research to be done to understand certain mechanisms like contrail formation. Uh, is it, is it um, a heating or a cooling effect depending on which, at which altitudes? Mm -hmm. So there still is a lot to be understood scientifically, and we need to absolutely, um, as you rightly point out, consider the full scope. And to follow, to follow up with that, are there any improvements on like hydrogen oxides and things with that nature? Uh, improvement on hydrogen oxide? Yeah, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen yes. Nitrogen oxide. Yes. Um, yes, depending on the, um, for instance, by continuing to improve the, the combustion si systems, right? So uh, typically uh, pre-mixing fuel and air in clever ways before ignition uh, is, is, ex is in a way, a way to, to control, absolutely, NOx emissions. So uh, in particularly, combustor technologies are very much at the heart of controlling that phenomenon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Maybe have one one more question. I can see the clock up there. So we have one more question, or I know we keep grazie on your time. We got a, we borrowed a little bit of time from her, and so we make sure she stays on target <laughs> to get out to her next stop on her trip here. Yeah, come on up real quick, Josh. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned uh, your interest in emerging technologies such as like quantum computing and machine learning. Uh, so do you see that playing a role in the shift to sustainability? And if so, how? Absolutely. Well, um, for me, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, high performance computing, and perhaps one day quantum technologies and quantum computing are fundamental enablers, which will help us accelerate on, on whatever our endeavor is, including certainly uh, the sustainability challenge. So um, high performance computing um, and algorithmic, uh, a, a quantum algorithmic approach, let's say, can certainly, when blended in the right percentage, help us solve very complex optimization uh, problems, right? And in, in, in aircraft and engine design, optimization 
is is definitely something we know is is of the essence. So um, it's enablers which will enable us to go faster and 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 be be more relevant in our conclusions. So yes, it's a component we must not forget. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have. On behalf of the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics, we have a, a small gift. There's a box. i got to get out of the box. Let me not drop it. I've seen too many trophy awards where somebody <laughs> drops the uh, Stanley Cup or the Champions League trophy off of the front of the bus. So it, as a recognition of being our uh, William E. Boeing Distinguished Lecturer, here's a little trophy a memento to put on your desk and show off that you are a friend of Purdue University. Thank oh, wow. you so much Thank you. For, for giving the lecture here. Let's give Grazie another hand. Wow. So I think what I'd like to do is if Todd's available, maybe Todd and, and can come up and we'll get a picture with the three of us here. And then after that, we'll have a, a small reception in the foyer, which is to my left. It'll be to your right. And so we'll do the picture and then you all can meet us and have a chat with all of us out in the foyer.